Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. 2023 is halfway over, and I've had the opportunity to play some amazing games, and I'm here to tell you about the top 10. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please make sure that you do. It is the best way to help us grow. And for those of you already subscribed, thank you so much for the continuous support. Let's talk about the top 10 board games of 2023 so far. Starting off with number 10, we have Motor City. This is a roll and write game where you are going to be controlling an entire company all about making cars. You'll be making them, researching them, as well as testing them out. You do this through a roll and write style game. Where you're going to be drafting dice. Now each dice has some icon on it, and there's also a bonus on the space where you take the die from. So you'll either get some additional actions, some extra cash resources, ideas, and then you'll take the action of whatever the dice says. Now based on the dice that you take, you'll be able to go up different tracks, unlock bonuses, scoring, and there's a lot of overlap with all of the different scoring criteria, which I really appreciate. Now my favorite thing about this game, though, has to be the way that you can invest in your actions and get multiple instances whenever you draft or take actions of that type. You can see those little dots on the bottom there. When you circle them in, you're investing, paying cash, or maybe taking extra actions that allow you to circle more so that every time you take that action, you'll get to do multiple instances of that. That being said, you want to make sure that you are still not neglecting the rest of the actions because there is some heavy overlap. So I like the way that you can actually use your investments, but the game does encourages you to invest in multiple areas. And this also is a really cool feature in the multiplayer game because you're able to look at what other people have invested in so you can take dice that they may be looking forward to and you also if you're playing a solo mode can actually use those things that you invested in and prioritize those so I like that there's some play when it comes to the solo as well as the multiplayer so that's my number 10 that is Motor City my number 9 goes to 51st State Ultimate Edition this is a engine building game that's based around cards where you play in a post-apocalyptic setting the game flow has you drawing new cards into your hand at the start of each round drafting some and then when it's the action phase, you'll be doing one thing at a time, playing cards in front of you, activating the cards that you already have, and potentially interacting with the cards that your opponents have. This is one of my favorite things about this game is the fact that there's interaction with the other players at the table, and I think that makes for this a particularly great two-player game, as every single step of the way, you're curious and terrified about what your opponent could do and how they're maybe interrupting your flow. There are reasons to attack your opponent's buildings, but when your building is destroyed, it's not the end of the world. You get some bonuses from it being destroyed, and it helps you play new cards in the future. So I like how it opens up different pathways while not necessarily completely shutting you down. Each of the sets has additional expansions that you can include, and that's one of my favorite parts is the cards themselves and how the expansions introduce them. So this Ultimate Edition comes with, I think, six or seven different expansions, including promos, and then full-fledged expansions, which are decks of cards that you'll shuffle in, and each of them offers new icons that give you new combos and ways to interact. And for example, let's take a look at one of these cards. It's got a cost in the upper left corner, it's got spoils that you take when you're able to destroy it, whether it be your opponents or you can use your own cards to actually kill your own cards in order to gain those resources if you need. And then it's got these icons that help you um, chain these different buildings to reduce the cost, ones that you can make deals with to just get straight income, and then actions that you can be using every effect. So there's multi-use purpose for these cards, whether you're using them for their abilities or you can even look at your opponent's cards and use those, which I think is so cool. So you have all this information that's floating out there, and then the expansions add new icons, new symbols that are built into this core card framework. So that is my number nine. That is 51st State Ultimate Edition. My number eight goes to Four Northwood, and this is a solo trick-taking game where you are going to be trying to recruit all of these cute woodland characters. And you do this through playing tricks. Every time that you're going to start a round, you'll pick one of these people that you're trying to have a discussion with, and that's like your negotiations, and then that character tells you how many tricks you need to win against them. You'll have a hand of eight cards, you can think about which one you're going to potentially be able to defeat, and in this case, win a certain amount of tricks, and so you'll decide, okay, I want to take on that one, and then you'll pick four special abilities that you'll take with you into that conversation. Every single round, the enemy will leave, so they'll reveal the card, and it's up to you to respond based on the cards you have to try to win the appropriate amount of tricks. My favorite thing about this game are the special abilities and the powers that you can get as you play. You start the game with four unique effects, and these use that foundational framework of trick-taking and change it in interesting ways. And every time you have a successful conversation, you're able to recruit new abilities, and you can swap in one of your original ones for this for a specific fight. So maybe you have a poor hand and you think this will help with that, then you can employ that special effect. And you can only use four abilities during each of these trick-taking sessions, so the timing is super important based on your hand. I love the decision space that comes from this, and how it 
but use that backbone of trick-taking, but in this unique way. Love it so much. This is the Four Northwood game, a solo trick-taking game, my number eight. My number seven goes to Darwin's Journey. It's a worker placement game where you're going to be customizing your workers with special wax seals. You have these large worker placement spots that are pretty pricey to visit if other players have already gone there, so there's some competition on the spaces, but those are going to allow you to get these seals for your characters, and then the more seals that you have, you're able to take stronger actions in the other areas, whether it be gaining even more seals, putting out these end of round bonuses, moving on multiple tracks, these ship tracks, or these exploration tracks, and I love the overlap of the two different tracks and how they tie to each other. And that's my favorite part about this game is the way that the exploration tracks merge with each other. The more you move on this boat track, the more islands you're able to explore, and the islands are first come first serve on almost everything there, so you're trying to race as much as you can. But do you focus on the islands you're on? Do you move forward? And when you're moving on the islands, you're also potentially decreasing the amount of negative points that you get during the scoring conditions. And then we flip over to the expansion boards. It gets even more crazy because in the Firelands, the oceans aren't tied to just three islands. Each island even has new sailing areas that it's tied to. So one island can lead to a new ocean area, and this new ocean area can lead to another island. And so you're sort of chaining back and forth between the actions, and it's super satisfying to watch as you cascade into new discovery effects and just get more abilities and powers and points. It feels great in order to see all of this chain reaction to occur. That is my number seven, that is Darwin's Journey. My number six goes to Hoplomachus Remastered. This is a gladiator fighting game where you're going to be taking your team of gladiators and fighting your opponent, trying to rile up the crowd in the process. Now, the game flow has you summoning new gladiators every round, maneuvering them, and then attacking with them. And every time you're able to either gain these King of the Hill spots or defeat your opponent's characters, you're able to rile up the crowd and gain crowd favor, which unlocks new powers and abilities for you. Your opponent is also going to get some bonuses for this as well, so it keeps the entire situation tense and exciting as both players are leveling up as the game progresses. You do have that ultimate goal of defeating your opponent's champion, and you're going to do this through dice rolling in all sorts of different combat areas. Now, my favorite part about this game are the different modes that are available for it and the one-shot nature of the experience. You want to do a head-to-head -head battle, you go ahead and grab your two different fighters from two different camps, they have different keywords that they interact with, and then you go for it. It's so much fun seeing how they interact with each other and what you're able to do in that small time period. I also love the solo and cooperative boss battles that are included in the game where you'll take a boss profile and it has an easy battle flow that you're able to manage and you're trying to complete this unique scenario in a short amount of time. It took all the things that I enjoyed from the original Hoplomachus as well as the huge boss battle and epic fights that you got in the Hoplomachus Victorum but put them in these one-shot scenarios that let you get into the action, have a blast, and get rid of the grind completely. So Hoplomachus Victorum is my favorite in this line of games, and I think that the two-player as well as the solo, whether it be competitive or cooperative experience, make this one a winner. So that is my number six. That is Hoplomachus Remastered. My number five goes to Earth. This is a card-based engine building game where you're going to be building up all of these different cards on your own personal island, creating an ecosystem with different terrain as well as flora. You're also trying to, at the same time, manage all of your different cards in order to meet this set scoring criteria. It's going to be randomized at the start of each game, and you'll do this through the use of playing cards based on symbols, different abilities and effects, and trying to manage this card grid in front of you in order to make the most value and get the most points by the end of the game. There's a variety of ways to score points, whether it be growing up your trees, getting sprouts for them, just playing cards that are worth a lot but can have various scoring effects, and a lot of the cards are going to care about what cards are placed around them, so when you place them down, it's going to be all based on the grid around. Now, my favorite part about this game is the turn flow and just how smooth the entire experience is. On your turn, you're going to be activating one of four actions. You get a strong effect. Everybody else gets a passive effect. And then you're going to trigger every single effect that is the same color on the cards that you've played. For example, if I did the red action and let me get some soil, and then I'd start from top to bottom on this grid of cards in front of me and activate all of my red abilities. This is a very clever way to keep you organized and on track as well, because you're going from top to bottom, left to right. And it's a great way to say, okay, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. And it happens naturally over the course of the game, and it's also linked to scoring potential, which is cool because it's not just helpful and keeps you on track with activating your abilities, but also is going to matter when it comes to your scoring criteria. But my favorite part about this game are these special event cards that you can pull whenever you're drawing cards. And these cards you can activate at any time during the gameplay. They're worth a variety of points, usually zero or negative points, but they're going to give you some way to make quick conversions that can push you into positions that you normally wouldn't be able to do anything about. So for example, if you did this top one here, you've got some glacial
features it looks like. This says that you can pay five sprouts and four growth in order to get six soil and draw four cards. So yes, you're getting rid of a bunch of points, but you're getting so much opportunity to maybe play a card that you wouldn't have been able to if you didn't. There are also some of the scoring opportunities that are going to allow you to actually get points for playing these event cards. So it makes it super enticing to play them and try to make that criteria happen. It's a lot of fun when you get them because you're trying to make them work into your strategy. And it also ties into all of the other aspects of the game, which I love. For a game that's a great blend of the card draw rate of something like Glory to Rome with an action system and engagement of something like Race for the Galaxy and Wingspan, this is Earth, my number five. My number four goes to Fuse Countdown. This is a real-time dice rolling cooperative semi-dexterity game where you play as a bomb disposal squad trying to defuse as many bombs as possible and hopefully everything before the 10-minute timer runs out. Now, the gameplay has you cooperatively rolling these dice and drafting them from the center trying to communicate and coordinate who's going to be taking what to try to fulfill these puzzle cards in front of you. Once you fulfill the puzzle card, you're able to get rid of it and draw a new one until you deplete that deck, and hopefully in time before that 10 minute timer. These puzzle cards have things like stacking in little pyramids based on specific numbers, trying to do simple addition or simple subtraction. You have all a variety of different dice that might matter for different cards, and they're also ranked on difficulty on how challenging they are to complete. My favorite part about this game are the spark cards and how they encourage cooperative play without completely regressing all of the progress you've made. Now, whenever you're drafting dice, if there are any dice left over, you have to take a spark card. And these spark cards give you new additional objectives you must complete before you finish the game. I love this system because in the original fuse, if you ever had a dice that you could not place, everybody would have to remove a die of that color. In this case, you still get to keep your progress. The penalty is still pretty awful and it is going to suck up your time, but it doesn't give you that feeling of regression, which I love. And this, of course, is going to help you with that cooperation because you're going to want to make sure you don't get these cards. You're going to cooperate. You're going to communicate and you're going to say, hey, can I get this die to make sure you're able to allocate all those dice. But if it doesn't happen, it's not the end of the world. And again, gives you a bit more leeway and choice of whether or not you want to take all that time to make sure you're cooperating, coordinating. Is it worth taking an objective card if you really need that die to make sure you get it and nobody else accidentally grabs it? I like how this gives the players more options without necessarily regressing the progress you've already made. So that's my number four, that is Fuse Countdown. My number three goes to Marvel Zombies, a zombicide game. Now this has you playing as the heroes of the Marvel Universe, but zombified versions. It takes the original zombicide game system and puts a slight twist to it where you are going to be the zombies devouring all of the innocent civilians. The missions in the mission book are hilarious as you're reading it from the perspective of the zombies trying your best to eat as much as possible and satisfy your hunger. Now, my favorite part about this game system is the hunger mechanism and how it's tied into everything. Every single time you take an action where you're rolling dice, you're going to add additional dice based on your hunger value. The more hunger you get, the more powerful all of your actions are. But if you're at the max hunger, then you become ravenous and all you can do is consume. I like this push and pull and this push your luck in every action where if you are pushing it too far and you make it to that top hunger, you're going to lose the ability to do all of your other actions and only feed and it can be pretty interrupting and everyone will have to help out to make sure you're not going to be self-damaging yourself. It permeates the entire experience and the abilities and traits also tie into this. In the original Zombicide, you had these item cards where you, you would be able to attach them and use their effects, but in this one you have the trait abilities that all tie to hunger gaining hunger losing hunger to allow you to get extra actions extra attacks move do things you normally wouldn't be able to and they're customized based on when you get them where you get them and whether or not you're willing to risk the hunger for it now right now there's only the core box out for marvel zombies we have the rest of the stuff coming in with all of the hero sides that you can play as instead of the zombies so i have not tried that one out yet you also have these large scenarios like galactus as well as the fantastic four guardians so we have so many new heroes that we haven't played yet. And I can see this rising up because my only ding on the game right now is just that the heroes feel like they're the only six that you can play and you usually play with four at a time. So right now there are only six characters you can play as, but with the new heroes, it's going to change things up because you're going to be able to mix and match your different enemies, locations, scenarios. And right now I'm still having a blast with it. Don't get me wrong here, but I'm excited to try more characters with more special abilities and see how they take on the different missions. So enjoying this one a lot. I can see this one going up more. That is Marvel Zombies 
my number three. My number two goes to the Witcher Old World. This has you playing as these monster hunters, the witchers who are traveling across a fantasy island. During the round, you're gonna be using your action cards to maneuver across the island based on the terrain symbols in the corner, and then increase all of your different stats, get new special abilities, potions, as well as increase the potency of your deck and hand of cards. At the end of your turn, if you're in an area with a monster or another witcher, you can challenge them to a fight, and if you're able to win, you get a trophy. It's the first of four trophies takes it. So you'll do that phase of moving, interacting, as well as fighting, and then sometimes you'll even get story events and abilities there that'll give you new points of interest, quests that you can explore, and you'll finish off your turn by adding new cards into your witcher's hand that you'll use in all of your future rounds. I love the way that you're interacting with this gigantic world, but my favorite thing about this just has to be the entire combat system, the way that the cards work, and your different level up trees and how they tie into it. So every time that you level up a skill, you're either going to be increasing your card draw in combat, your defense value, which prevents you from taking damage, as well as your potion ability, which are these one-time abilities that you can use in combat. And then each character also has their own special unique ability that's tied to their own specific Witcher school, and they'll need to train at their own headquarters, their castle that they're going to be working at. Now, the combat itself also has you trying to link up these different colored symbols. So the deck building matters a lot because you're trying to get the different characters that have cards that work well together. So for example, if you look at this yellow card here, it's got this purple little tag. So if you had a purple card in your hand when you're doing your combat, you'd play that yellow one, use that link to get an extra damage, then play your purple card and get an additional ability for whatever that purple card is. And if you have more cards that have those tags, you can link them over and over and over again and get to these giant positions where you can pull off one giant turn. I love that you can get defense and there are even cards that have special ability text on them. There are reactions when they're discarded from your effects, cards that come back into your hand. And it's such a cool puzzle because not only is your deck the way that you're going to be doing damage in your hand going to be able to set you up for defending and attacking, but it's also your life force. Whenever you're attacking, you're dealing damage to that opponent's deck, that opponent's hand, and then if they're out of all their cards, you win the battle. I like how it's a trade-off between every single thing, and it's a little bit weird to wrap your head around the first time, but after a couple battles, it's engaging and it's exciting, and the way that the AI system is handled is they just have a single deck of cards that they're just pulling off of, and it's easy to manage and also just a blast to play. I also love the Witcher v. Witcher fights. As you know a little bit about what's in the other player's deck, the abilities that they have, the things that they're willing to spend to gain victory, and if you're able to defeat an opponent's Witcher, you're able to get their own unique trophy with a new unique ability for yourself. While the two-player competitive core game is awesome, there are a bunch of expansions that are also included with The Witcher, and one of my favorites is The Witcher Old World Wild Hunt. This gives you a cooperative and solo mission where you're going to be trying to take down members of The Wild Hunt. You'll pick one of them to start, one of their special cards, as well as their four special combat cards, and they'll have unique effects that are going to be something that you'll want to prepare for during your short game of only eight turns. So you have eight turns to build up your character, progress, defeat monsters, manage the entire fantasy land so that your character is ready for an epic final fight. And it does a great thing with the action system as well with multiple players where you are having your turns at the same time so everyone is engaged while the game is actually happening. I love this system and I think that the Wild Hunt is an amazing expansion. There are several more expansions that came with the Kickstarter so I'm just scratching the surface on this one. I've had it for about a week but looking forward to trying out with the mages which give you an entire new characters to play with. You have the Skell League, which gives you ways to explore the ocean, and then you even have ones that give more personality to different characters. That's the one that I'm looking forward to the most with like these giant monster cards. Looking forward to this in general, and right now, this has been an absolute blast. That is The Witcher Old World, my number two. And my number one goes to Arenenberg Canal. This is a one or two player worker placement game where you're trying your best to build out different buildings and surround them with different canals and roads and railroads, triggering different abilities and effects while managing this resource wheel and taking worker placement actions in order to gain the most value from them. Now, I love the flow and pacing of this game as every single time you take an action, you're gaining resources, gaining cards, or building out roads. It's pretty straightforward, but there are incentive systems built into the game where it's going to accumulate cash on all the spaces that are unused, so it gives you reason to take different routes that you would normally go through. Also, all of the cards are displayed and come from these different sets of cards. So you have six different sets, I think, to play from, 
and you're only taking a couple of cards from each color of those sets. So every time you play the game, it's going to be a unique experience. Each of those cards is an objective that you're giving to yourself that you can activate multiple times. Let's take a look at one of these cards here. It's a lot of information here, but so easy to look at once you start learning the game. You have a cost on the top here, a base point value, the name, the loading enterprise, and then you have a requirement on the bottom. This one says that if it's next to at least one water and at least one road, then you have the opportunity to pay two coal for two bricks and three dollars. Now, when you're able to completely surround one of these cards, you're going to trigger its effect. But there's also another resource in the game called the bridge that says if you're able to connect two bridges, you also can activate its effect. So you're trying your best to make sure you're placing your different cards so that the abilities activate, but you're also able to activate them multiple times. And some of the cards will even give you abilities based on your entire board. Some will give you these outlandish effects that you have to make work, but when you do, it's so satisfying. And you have that display of cards that you can pick from. So from turn one, you can start making plans of cards when you want to activate them, however you want to activate them, and even with a delayed effect, be able to make the most benefits from them. It's such a satisfying game plan when you're able to use these things you've invested in multiple times and then as you start building out your area you're using all of this infrastructure and routes that you've built so you're getting new cards giving yourself new challenges and it's extremely satisfying my favorite thing is definitely the cards i love that card system of giving yourself objectives that have awesome powers and abilities different ways to score but you're able to actually benefit from them multiple times one of my favorite games from uwe rosenberg is hollow town i love the card system there because you're just playing them fast and you're getting so many cards and playing them all sorts of the place. But in this one, you are thoughtfully taking each card, but you get to use it multiple times, which I love. And then when you're done, your board is this huge display of cards and abilities you've activated. And that repetition of effects, especially the large cards at the end, feels so gratifying when you're able to pull them off. A Rainenburg Canal is at the top of my list on wanting to play more solo as that objective driven solo nature of the game just calls me. And it's exactly what I'm looking for in a game system like this. That is my number one. That is a Rainenberg Canal. And that's the list. Those are my favorite games from 2023 so far. I'm curious to hear what your favorite games from 2023 are and which ones should I be checking out. What did you think of the list? What did you think of my ordering? Any surprises here? Any games that completely caught you off guard? Any opinions that you disagree with, frankly? I'd love to hear what you think. But thank you so much for watching. Side Game Strong.